The views and opinions expressed during this show do not necessarily reflect like the, the policy, policy or position of any affiliated workplace or employer. The views and opinions of the show do not constitute recommendations for therapy. Please, Please contact, contact a licensed SLP for individual consult on your situation. Please listen carefully. What is communication? An essential behavior of life. We have the both blessing and responsibility of trying to foster another. It's transmitting a thought from one person to another. It's the strongest way for two people to convey information to each other. The back and forth between two people. Communication is a lifeline. Just connection with other people. Connecting people in terms of ideas or thoughts or needs. Draws us out of ourselves, draws us into that relationship, you know, builds up our families. Without it, we'd be lost. Whatever it is that we do to express intent and achieve an impact. Communication is the ability to express your needs, wants, frustrations, and desires to anyone that you feel needs to have that information. Welcome to Speech Science episode number 140. I'm Matt Hott, a speech and language pathologist located in the school districts and also with home health care, working with dementia and stroke rehab, joined by our pediatric speech and language pathologist, Michelle Wintering. Hi, Matt. And the man, the myth, the legend, the executive functioning guru, speech and language pathologist, Michael McLeod. How's it going, buddy? Good, guys. And before we did the taping tonight, we did just a little mini uh, Facebook Live. So I think for episode number 141, we should try to go live. Everyone so celebrates the 141st version of something, right? Live and unplugged. Mm. Not many people have 141st birthdays. So. That's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Oh, on the 140th birthday, though, that's what we're celebrating today. Uh, we're going to talk about a new program that is offering neurodiversity specialization in autism. Also, we're going to look at the comparative effects of picture symbols with text versus text only. We uh, check in with what ASHA may or may not be doing right. We have our news headlines. Uh, of course, we want to hear from you as well. So make sure you head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. And from there, you can give us a phone call, 614-681-1798, or hit us up on the hashtag SSPod on the social medias. But let's start off like we always do. Mike, we talked a little bit about on the live stream, but your little baby got all her shots. How are y'all doing over there? How's life in therapy land? Yep, she got her uh, two-month-old shots today at the doctor's office. That was a traumatic experience for all three of us. Uh, Ooh, watching those her... are the worst appointments. <laughs> yes, it was not fun, but you listen to the doctor, you get it done, and here we are. Now she's been sleeping all day uh, and looking forward to having my baby back tomorrow. Uh, Enjoy uh, the sleep, though, dude. <laughs> three kids later, I tell you what, the day after yeah. vaccines, that is a quiet afternoon. Okay. All right. It's good. It's good to know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, <laughs> therapy, therapy wise, uh, uh, things are going well, very, very busy. Uh, this is always uh, an exciting time of year. Uh, you know, once that long, long month of March is over, you're in April, you're starting to, you know, creep towards the end of the, end of the school year. Uh, weather's getting nice, do some therapy outside, do, you know, get, get some more groups going outside. Uh, lots of people are getting vaccinated now. Uh, so we're, you know, we're inching towards what should be an exciting summer. That's awesome. Michelle, how are, th how are things going on over uh, in your way? Are you in, where are you first off? And then how are things going with the potential future move or, or house buying or all of the above, all the uh, above the family yes. with the children, what is going on? I am still in Kansas. Okay. And I'm not looking forward to my daughter's upcoming appointment. Mike made me think of it that uh, she will be getting some more shots at, but, uh, you know, got to protect her. So we'll do it. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing well here, enjoying the sunshine that's starting to come around more often and looking forward to just all these changes that are coming again because we keep moving <laughs> so um, we are moving to texas as i told you and we are buying a house we close in june now did you keep your texas license 
I did. Hey, hey. so I don't have to get a new Michelle one. Oh, yeah, so you. that's exciting because we did not know we would be going back to Texas, but we are. And if anyone is in Central Texas, be sure to hit me up because I would love to connect with some SS Pod folks. Fair enough. For me, on my side, my boys are finally in swim classes. They've been doing it for four weeks now. So my seven-year-old is about five years too late. And my four-year-old is about two years too late on swim lessons because I was afraid they would drown. And I used to be a lifeguard. So judge me as a parent and a former uh, lifeguard. Um, other than that, I'm excited to be back. I was outside. a lifeguard too. Were you I really? Didn't know that about you. Yeah, I taught yeah. swim lessons for years, but I've been. I need to get my son into them as well. And I don't think you're too late. Well, so. I mean, comparatively, like I've been afraid that my oldest would fall into a pool for the last five years, so I probably should have started him way back. Yeah, but yeah, no, I was a lifeguard at a uh, Boy Scout camp. I used to teach rowing and canoeing. Oh, so you did open water? I did. It's terrifying because it's open murky water Mm -hmm. y'all but no uh, I'm excited that the weather's finally changed here in Ohio and from a therapy standpoint I mentioned this on the live stream uh, we've got seven weeks left in the school year uh, and then my home health care stuff ramps up considerably but man when you're working the schools and you get that seven week notice uh, it's not exciting at all it is terrifying a seven now, week notice for what? For the end the, of the year? Till the end of the year. <laughs> Just prepping you for all the paperwork you have to do in the next two months. Well, and that's that. And it's also like um, I'm making sure all my students have their minutes met. And for some of the students mm-hmm. that have like attendance issues, you're like, okay, we are short X amount of minutes. And I need to figure out how we are going to address this. So we need to have an IEP team meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So have you gotten being in the schools? I'm just curious, or if Mike, if you've experienced this, have you had any more families with post return to school after COVID lockdown? Have you had any more families requesting IEP meetings? Um, not at the annual date. I would say so. Yeah, I would say, uh, there's definitely, definitely parents are showing in increased sense of urgency after that experience with virtual school that they had. Um, And sort of the transition has been hard for the kids going from their natural environment to the more structured environment of school. So I think parents are looking to get as many accommodations as possible uh, to help their children. I think because I hadn't thought about the accommodations piece. Mm -hmm. I think it's because we've also moved our meetings to online. It's a whole lot easier for parents to schedule meetings and come to meetings and also since our whole life has changed that we now understand how zoom or google meets or blackboard or group facetime work that it's now a whole lot easier for a parent you know because we were always available working in the schools you're always available if they say okay we need to have a meeting on friday at noon you're like let me rearrange a group and i can be there But now a parent doesn't have to take four hours out of their day. They can schedule the one hour meeting into their schedule, walk to the car, go to an office and and pop in. So like in a weird way, I'm actually okay with the increased parent meetings. Now that's, I love that you guys are pointing this out because I hadn't thought of that. I'm not in a school right now and it's, are you seeing more attendance at those meetings too of more Mm -hmm. outside therapists like Mike or other professionals who are able to attend who couldn't have before it was virtual? I think so. That's a great question. Yeah, I I would say so. And I I think uh, the Zoom IEP meetings actually benefit the families, of course. Uh, And I think they're a little bit easier on the school staff as well. Uh, So Zoom IEP meetings, I think that's a great question for our our audience. Do you want Zoom IEP meetings or Google Meet IEP meetings to continue? Is it easier on you to do it from your therapy room and not have to be in a room filled with people? So I I think that should be a a thing that stays. That should be a positive change from this experience. The only issue I have is sometimes some of these meetings are an hour and a half long, two hours long, and I speak for about 15 minutes. Yeah, that's, Mm -hmm. that's no good. 
speechsciencepodcast.com, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com, 614-681-1798. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Michelle. Just wanted to throw out our stats. No, I, I kind of took a sideline there, but I was curious what your experiences were. So thanks. Yeah. Hey, make sure you also check out the Discord, discord.speechsciencepodcast.com. And a question came up on the Discord replacing the due process this week, guys. And I wanted to ask you all about this. Um, so Marissa uh, over on the Discord brought up that she has her comps. And I don't remember taking comps at Ohio University. Did we take a comprehensive exam? When you say comps, like a, a comprehensive test? Yeah, like at the end of our two-year program, did we have to take a comprehensive exam? Some schools do that. Some schools yeah. don't. It's totally up to it's totally up to the school. Did you? We take had one, to Mike? take. We had to take no, the praxis. We had to do uh, praxis. Is is not affiliated with grad yeah, school. Yeah, that's just no. Manager. It's so, not. Yeah. But our program required us to take it while in school. Yeah, they can do that. They can do that. They can make it a, a graduation requirement. Uh, but every school does it differently. So for us, we had to do like a like an interview, like an intensive interview with with staff members so we had to be like in a room and answer questions and all that all that crap do you think maybe the praxis was our comps then i mean it pretty much was i i okay. know that from applying to different programs that obviously the praxis is not a part of graduate school but i know our program matt it was required see i know i i picked the school based on not having comps Oh, I didn't do that intentionally, but yeah, I did. I, did. I, I was looking I at schools that didn't have that comps. one that required the praxis and had high numbers of passing mm. rates for the praxis. So. Yeah, mine was I didn't want to take comps at the end because I'm a terrible. Well, I'm like I'm a terrible standardized test taker. Like, I only got like a, a 1200 on the ACTs and only got like a 29 on the ACTs. Like, and then barely passed like the GREs. So like. I'm a terrible, I got a 610 on my Praxis. Like I am not a standardized test taker. Praxis was incredibly oh. easy. I, I thought it was easy. Dude, I had like 10 questions on Cruda chat syndrome. I did not think it was easy. I think I, thought it, I like every, <laughs> everybody in my uh, cohort was just freaking out about it. Like, oh my God, the Praxis, the Praxis. And they were all sharing their scores and stuff. So I signed up, didn't tell anybody. And was like, I'm just going to take it, see how I do, what happens. And then the score comes up at the end. And I was not aware of the scoring scale at all. Like, I thought it was like zero out of 100 or something. And then uh, this number came up and I was like, oh, shit, did I fail? Like, what Like what? What just happened? So I ran to my car, Googled it, and I was like, oh, I passed. Okay, cool. And it just, and See, it. Mike, this is where I forget that you're younger than me because <laughs> I took my exam. Ours was not on the computer like then, that. It, it took, really? well, I took it on the computer, but then I had to like, no, wait, was it a Scantron? It was Scantron. Yeah. Mine was a Scantron. Yes. Maybe this is the testing facility. No, but I know right. mine was. Mine was a Scantron at Xavier University. I was the only person taking a speech pathology praxis. And then I didn't get my results for three months or two months. I got my results literally as like I took it on a computer in a testing facility and the results came up immediately. Yeah, no, dude. I had to like <laughs> register for the next Praxis. It was transitioning to was the it? electronic when I think, I believe when we took it, but we were also transitioning, at least, I don't know if you experienced this, Mike, because now they have the common application, right? Mm -hmm. For graduate programs. And that was just becoming a thing when Matt and I were applying, I know, because I remember a couple schools I applied to, they didn't, nobody trusted it yet. It was the first year or so that they had it. And so even if a school was doing the common application, you still had to submit a second application directly to them mm -hmm. yes! because they didn't, so you had to do it twice. <laughs> it made no benefit. It was no benefit for us. <laughs> oh, Man, Crazy. like back in our day, we also had to walk up the hill and there was, oh, no, back in our day. There was no air conditioning. I'm pretty sure we're one year off from Mike. Mike, how old are you? <laughs> I just in February turned 34. See, yeah, you're I'm the 35. same age as me. It's fine. All right. I'm 87. What, what year are you guys? 86. I'm, 86. I'm, 80, I'm 80, 
So I'm, I'm eighty-seven. We've got three, we go. three years. There we go. We oh, were all, man. We were all destined to meet on Zoom. So there we go. That was the, M. that was the conversation from the Discord. You want to make sure you head over to discord.speechsciencepodcast.com, sign up, and it's basically like the old chat rooms of the '90s, but on your phone. Uh, and it was actually a pretty cool little conversation about that. Also, you can check out the merchandise dot speech science podcast dot uh, com. All right, let's jump into our first article of the day. Uh, we're looking at this out of the ASHA leader. Michelle, you threw this up there. It's the, the graduate program offering a neurodiversity specialization uh, in autism. It's Keene University. Uh, this seems super interesting, y'all. So I think it ties right in what we were talking about, the differences between grad programs, because I don't remember seeing many programs that had a specialization offered. I don't remember any. During, um, during graduate school. And I've since graduating and working, obviously, but I've heard of programs offering, oh, you can get a fee certification. You can get a, some other certification or specialization that is really functional to your clinical career um, during these two years of graduate school. And I think that is wonderful. So I, th I thought this was great, especially because I know I have so much to learn still when it comes to really challenging myself to be a, a neurodiverse um, therapist, like appreciating <laughs> neurodiversity, learning from neurodiversity and like challenging myself with it, right? So that I can better serve my patients. And this is just interesting because, I mean, we're in April right now. Mm -hmm. It is Autism Awareness Month. Yep. And- as we've discussed before, I'm still working on making sure that I either ask the person or say autistic person because person first language was pounded into my head for so long. So the, the idea of the program, and, and I, you're right, Michelle, like I don't remember tracks ideas. We went to the same grad school, uh, but this track or not this track, but this specialization, uh, the students choose eight electives from 22 possible options, including two autism related classes, uh, communication and social skills taught from a neurodiversity perspective. Uh, through this 16 graduate students selected based on their letters of intent can choose their neuro ally specialization track and it's to better understand autistic individuals as neurodivergent quote to use a strength-based approach and assessment and intervention to share the best practices and raise awareness promote the value acceptance and inclusion of people uh, with ASD uh, I love this idea uh, there's also a monthly non-credit activity that they have to participate in as well but you're right I mean like I remember like like we were talking about uh multiple times throughout the, the show, this course of this program that we were taught to use first person language. And then all of a sudden, no, it's now it's different. And I had no idea, no background about anything neurodivergent or neurotypical or whatever before grad school. This was even during grad school. I, everything that I've learned has been through mistakes that I have made as a professional. And luckily I've been guided by other professionals to be better. And those terms weren't at least commonly used when you and I and Mike entered the profession. And, but there you go. That's, that's why I love this field too, is because we have to keep learning. You're going to mm -hmm. be a stale therapist if we, if we, um, if we don't keep up with this sort of thing. That's true. Everything is changing and, uh, and autism rates continue to, to increase uh, and, you know, the spectrum continues to grow. Uh, and, you know, this, this is one of the benefits of, of social media is we get to learn more about the unique individuals that make up this world. And uh, we can see exactly, you know, all these misconceptions we have in our head about all different types of people. Uh, you know, we now have an opportunity, especially as therapists who help people develop skills, uh, we can learn about you know, exactly how people approach certain skills and how they feel about them and what we can do to better serve others. So here's my question. And I feel like our program is slowly marching towards the clinical doctorate degree. 
are we looking at eventually a three to four year program in speech therapy? I think something's got to happen because I think the current system of uh, like so many grads, graduate programs and constantly, you know, constant graduating classes every semester of so many new SLPs. And in many instances, mm -hmm. these new SLPs are replacing seasoned SLPs because the young ones obviously are cheaper than the older ones. Uh, so I think, uh, I, I think the current system is not long lasting. Uh, I think there's too many graduate programs. I think it's not mm. as intensive. I think that uh, a lot of the job market in very specific areas is drying up. Uh, so I think it's very, very important uh, to, I think ASHA is going to have to take a hard look at it. Obviously, ASHA most likely wants as many graduate programs as possible, and they want as many speech therapists as possible because they get paid by the graduate programs and they get paid for all the ASHA applicants and all the ASHA dues. Uh, but I think it's, um, it, this is not going to, this is not something that's going to last long-term. Well, so I, sorry, Matt, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and, and like, I remember that we had to take a few um, oh, courses that were outside of our program. And I don't remember, I, I, I took sign language and I don't remember any other pro, any other electives that I took that were useful. Or uh, we lost you there for a second, Matt. I'm back. I, I, I don't remember taking any electives outside of sign language that were useful or helpful. I mean, is there discussion knowledge. about changing it to three or four years? I've always said, I've, I've wondered why it's not a three-year doctorate. Like physical mm -hmm. therapy and occupational therapy is becoming... Um, because we already have a clinical fellowship year, right? And none of those. Do it. So why don't we build that into the third year, and cover a couple other things that would make it that way? But I have no idea the feasibility of that. Now I will say also self-selecting, right? Mm -hmm. The electives I really liked. I can think of one of my electives I took, um, an aging and the lifespan course. Oh yeah, that's good. That was in I can't remember the social work department. Mm -hmm. um, Might have been social work. And it talked specifically about aging populations and their perspectives on life and their perspectives on looking back at their life retrospectively. And I know that that wasn't directly speech related, but it had to do with communication and, and taking the perspective mm -hmm. of the people I'd be working with in a nursing home or in home health. I took child psychology. That was one of mine. Mm -hmm. I took a, I think I took mm -hmm. that one too with you. I don't know, guys. I just feel like if we're looking at programs changing, Mike, you're right. I think the current model is is not not here forever. They're already kicking the door or kicking the rocks about a clinical doctorate. I, I feel like we need some version of diversity training. I mean, we look at the field, it's 3% male. It's, I, I, and I unfortunately, I don't know the percentage that is uh, non- what is it? BIPOC? Uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I forget what BIPOC means right now. Non-white. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. Yeah. And I, uh, black, black indigenous and, black and people and of color. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I unfortunately don't know the percentages off of that, but that's just our field. The population we work with is not 97% white female. And I think we need. No, because to... we work with the lifespan. Right. And that's why I feel like we need more tracks that are like, you know, this, this neuro allies track, but for a lot of places and it's, yeah. you know, I mean, no offense to, to Mike, but like, if you threw me into Jersey, I wouldn't know how to interact with big city folks. <laughs> you are a big city folk, dude. Ah, Cincinnati's a nice little city on the river. Is it's it a, though? It's a pretty big city. I know, but, I, and I'm just kind of using that facetiously, but like, but like legit handling somebody that is from Appalachia, West Virginia is going to have different needs and different views of what's important than somebody from Cleveland or Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's up to us to figure that out and improvise and build that rapport because that's, you know, no one, no one builds rapport like an SLP, but you know, because we're talking to them while physical therapy is having them do leg lifts. 
There you go. But <laughs> just just in, just in general, uh, you know, there's there's definitely some things that that need to change. And you know, there's that stereotypical thing of SLPs. All they do is play games with kids, and they're on the ground playing games all the time. And for some reason, that just speaks to you know that creates 98 percent women uh so you know ash is not doing their job of, of changing it to get more men applicants uh and not also you know just the current just like we said the current system is more of the same it's just bringing in more and more of the exact same people not diversified and sending them out to work with a diversified population now, can I add though quick back yeah, to our neurodiversity it. article, just because I don't want to forget to say this, I've added it to my library list to check out, but they said on this track that they have a, they read and discuss, the group of students read and discuss a book called Neurotribes by Steve. Yes. Silverman. Yes. And I have not read that yet. And it is on my to read list now. I follow him on Twitter uh, and he's, he's great. So he's an adult male. He's written several books, I think, uh, of about living with autism. So he's a he's a he's an interesting guy. Definitely worth a follow. He's an autistic person himself. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. What diversity training or specialty track or area did we not cover that you think needs to be mentioned? Head over to our website, Speech Science Podcast. Dot com. Give us a phone call, 614-681-1798, or email speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. That book keeps coming up uh, in different conversations, and I do feel like I need to finally take the step and uh, finally read that. Well, I was just at the in the library for the first time in well over a year now yeah. uh, today with my son for a very limited capacity story time and um, put a couple books on hold. So I'm going to add that to my hey, list for next time. Mm -hmm. Oh, the next article that we were discussing comes out of the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology. Uh, it's from Christine Hollyfield, Holly Comparative Effects of Picture Symbol with Paired Text and Text Only Augmentative and Alternative Communication Representations on Communication from Children with autism spectrum disorder. So right out of the bat, first off, this is a very small study, Michelle. You said it was uh, four students big, but we were talking off air. Four school-age children. Four school-age children. And I started to talk about the results and you said the conclusion. So please, what were you saying that, what is the big difference between results and conclusion as we break down this article? Um, results would be just the, the stats. You know, you're looking at what the result what the results were what the outcome was and conclusions are kind of the interpretation of that so mm -hmm. what are the takeaways um and often results you're gonna see um things might look more drastic than they really are but conclusions are where the authors likely are going to explain correlation versus causation or the need for more research so the results here showed, and, and I know we just went over that, so I'm just going to go with the results real quick, uh, that, uh, let's see, we're relatively successful using, uh, two, two of them were relatively successful using picture symbols before the study. And in response to intervention, all participants demonstrated increases in communication across representation conditions and maintain those increases. However, participants demonstrated generalization in the text-only representation condition but that's different than the conclusion so please michelle of the three of us you're the only one that worked in a research part of the lab help me <laughs> a dumb slp understand no. um, why i should I wanna take go that back, with a grain of salt i want to go back through this article okay again myself just to understand it more because when i was going reading through it and then looked at their conclusion i want to understand it better mm -hmm. but i will give you what i've got now uh, children with the conclusions read children with asd who were preliterate, which is interesting because they said all of the kids were mm -hmm. preliterate, but there's only four okay so their conclusion is that these four children acquired communication of comparable rates regardless of whether an AAC app utilized picture symbols with paired text or text only representation. So they did not do um, just 
pictures. They were comparing pictures and or pictures with words or just words. Correct. Therefore, while larger scale research is needed, there's your big part of mm -hmm. saying don't run with this and think that is the end all be all. <laughs> so <laughs> Matt, calm down. Got it. Larger scale research is needed. Clinicians and technology developers could consider increasing the use of text and AAC representation given the inherent value associated with learning to recognize written words. So they don't touch on in their conclusions, their interpretation of it. Um, anything about the generalization in the text only representation. But I'm wondering if what they were alluding to is generalization mm. um, of the written word. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. And I was scrolling down through and they were talking about imageability of the vocabulary words used as well. So, mm -hmm. so they're generalizing the printed word. So that's why they're saying, hey, we should look at this more for, um, showing the printed word with the picture just as a pre-literacy tool. And I mean, like, it kind of makes sense that the more exposure we have to real words, the easier it will be to generalize those words later, right? Well, in some ways you're going to indirectly be working on sight words because they might mm -hmm. recognize some of these words even if they can't really read them. Yeah. The war, the the high but imageability Definitely words. more research. This is a yes. preliminary research article no, with that's four fair. kids. And we need some PhD student out there to say, I want to work on this and I'll run with it. Got it. I'll do that right now. Mike, <laughs> what does this tell you just from a preliminary standpoint when when you're looking at executive functioning? What kind of tips you off a little bit when you hear uh, high imageability, low imageability, the idea that text only was a little bit easier to generalize? Again, a study of four, and I think they had like eight words in each category. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, text text in the brain is a lot easier to be words, sort of, ten words. yeah, is, is a lot easier to be sort of memorized and held a little bit longer than the visuals. Uh, so, you know, nonverbal working memory is the foundation of executive functioning, the visual imagery of the brain. Uh, that's really, you know, the biggest thing is being able to hold an image in mind and manipulate it and change it and those sorts of things. But having language and verbal working memory, uh, it's a lot easier for kids to compensate by sort of just holding it there and memorizing it in more of a short term. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm excited to see where the study goes. I feel like this could help a lot when we talk AAC, when we talk about uh, LAMP or touch chat or fill in the blank of any other device, PRC, Toby, whatever. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, so I did that MinSpeak training oh, about yes, a year right. ago. Yeah. And if you're following their pattern of learning usually they do it without the words first because they don't want mm -hmm. because it's a unique sort of platform like not all aac devices digital aac devices are um word groups like mm -hmm. minspeak uses right. so the apple can mean a bunch of different things it's like an infinite possibility of meaning so they don't want the word apple on there because they don't want you to only think apple no that makes sense which mm -hmm. to me threw me off because I was thinking more like this small scale study of, oh, we want to input literacy and give them the words, you know, pre-literacy, I should say, not literacy when they're just being exposed to the word. But um, it's, it's interesting. And I hope, I'm sure there's more research out there that I'm not aware of. Oh. So send it our yeah, way. Let is, us know. This was the first study I've ever seen of something like this um, that was not like recent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So speech science podcast.com speech science podcast at gmail.com 614-681-1798. Uh, a little peek behind the curtain, y'all. I hate it. I moved my second monitor way to the left. So now I have to like crane my neck to read the script. So that's why I look so weird over here. And all of us Come with on. our glasses trying to. <laughs> and on the flip side of the break, also, Michelle, we have to make a mea culpa that podcasting we just said was super easy um 
it's not. And sometimes files get lost and then you try to upload them and then they don't happen. And then you find out that an episode that should have aired in season three never made it on air. Uh, so we are reposting the interview for this episode on 140. Uh, Michelle, what's a little background on that one? So uh, this interview is with Craig Goldslager. He is an accountant and we connected with him first at ASHA in Florida. And he approached us and was interested in connecting with our podcast and with our community because he um, tailors his services to SLPs. So his wife is an SLP and he saw and met so many other SLPs and especially those in private practice and felt that he could support us. So, um, you know, here's the interview that I want to go re-listen to because I know he had some really good practical tips for money management and especially if you're doing any kind of private practice for SLPs. And he, since then, since our interview has also, um, I know been interviewed on other podcasts, but he's joined the podcast world and has mm -hmm. a podcast called SLP Money. So if you want something that's tailored to our profession, but from somebody with a skill set that many of us don't have ourselves, then this is the interview for you. So I hope you enjoy it. And Craig, thanks for being patient. Yeah, my bad, man. <laughs> like sometimes, man, you'll understand as you're doing your own podcast, something like as weird as a edited file goes away. And then, oops. Yeah, and, and it depends on up. where it's it's mm -hmm. listed and posted and what platform. It's, it's anyways. Check in with the informed SLP, and then we'll check in with Asha. You're listening to Speech Science. This is the story of a very special woman. Just a few knew about her superpowers. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician. She masqueraded as a regular person at work, but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her mom. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources at aarp.org caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. And now for our regular research review, brought to you by the Informed SLP. The Informed SLP releases a monthly newsletter that brings you plain language reviews of only the newest, most clinically applicable research, keeping you up to date on advances in the field and saving you tons of time. So let's get to it. The Mansura Fees Residue Rating Scale. This is a review of the article, Mansura Fiber Optic Endoscopic Evaluation of Swallowing Residue Rating Scale, MFRRS, an anatomically based tool, a preliminary study, published in Folia Phoniatrica e Logopedica. Hey fees clinicians, there's a promising new tool for you to objectively measure pharyngeal retention on your studies that's easy to learn and use. As many fees clinicians will attest, fees is often chosen over video fluoroscopic swallow studies when you need to have a more sensitive understanding of how much post swallow retention you're dealing with. But arbitrarily designating the amount of residue as mild or moderate can cause confusion and affect important clinical decisions, like what diet texture you recommend. The Mansura Fiber Optic Endoscopic Evaluation of Swallowing Residue Rating Scale, MFRRS, is actually made up of two distinct scales, one to measure residue in the vollecula and another specifically for the piriforms. The MFRRS differs from other similar scales in a couple of ways. First, this uses clear anatomical boundaries as the landmarks against which to measure volume of residue. Many of the current scales judge residue on a binary level, so 
present or absent. But this scale has very clear definitions for each score, succinctly providing a more detailed measure of residue based on where it hits the various anatomy landmarks. Clinicians use still images taken during the test to review and rate the volume of residue in relation to the anatomical landmarks on a scale of 0 to 6. See the article for detailed descriptions of each rating. This preliminary study found the MFRRS to be reliable and valid, and study raters found it easy to use, even for clinicians new to the fees game. It hasn't been studied with kiddos yet or those with altered anatomy, so using the scale with folks with postoperative changes, people with head and neck cancer, for instance, would be challenging. It's so important for us to have objective, easy-to-use tools in our practice, and the MFRRS is now yet another tool in your toolbox to analyze our studies with less ambiguity. An additional potential application is that we could use the scale in baseline fees prior to initiation of treatment and show objective improvement following our intervention. That's a win for the patients and a win for us SLPs. Thanks for listening to this review. If you're interested in more, come visit us at www.theinformedslp.com. Tell us how you put the research into practice, or find us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at The Informed SLP. Welcome back to the Speech Science Podcast. I am Michelle Wintering, and today I am sitting here with Craig Goldslager, and he is of a company called Utterly Financial. You are the owner of Utterly Financial out of Florida, and he's a financial planner, but not just your average financial planner. He is someone who focuses specifically on helping SLPs prepare for retirement. And he and I connected at ASHA this year back in November, and I thought it would be great to bring him on because I do think, especially as speech pathologists, we often talk about wanting to do private practice or looking into the future of how can we kind of have more control of our career and our finances. And here's somebody who's actually um, focused on SLPs when it comes to money. So uh, I loved on your website where you said you were married to speech pathology, literally. And I think I'll let you take it from there, but your wife yeah. is in SLP. That's correct. Thank you so much, Michelle, for having me. And it was great to connect with you at ASHA back in Orlando. And yeah, I am literally married to speech pathology. My wife is a practicing SLP. She's been an SLP for several years now. And fortunately, I got to see her through sort of the entire process as she was finishing. We met when she was finishing her CF. And she's worked for a few employers in our county. Now she works in our school district. And so, yeah, I've, I live speech pathology every day. I have numerous clients who are, as you mentioned, private practice owners just starting out. So we really focus on helping plan for retirement and thinking about all the other financial decisions you have to make along the way. So when did you come to, hey, I'm going to do financial advising and financial planning, but the switch the focus to SLPs? So I, I've been a financial planner for eight years now. And historically, I've been working with pre-retirees and retirees, just living in South Florida. That's a predominant I didn't even think of that. And that's a, that's a, a good of, population there. Right. A lot of them down here. And so I got involved with speech pathology when I went to go speak at my, where my wife got her master's degree down here at one of the local universities. I spoke to their graduating students in their seminars class, and the professor just wanted me to sort of give a financial literacy 101 class, just how to look at employer benefits, what type of insurances you might need, how to pay taxes. Just if you go back to those days where just thinking about how you focus so much of your time in school, learning your trade, learning your craft, how to be the best SLP you can be, but not so much on the financial side. So she thought it would be beneficial if I gave a class and taught like that. So that was then turned into a conversation the professor shared with another local SLP private practitioner. So I started giving seminars to local business owners in the area and their SLPs. And then I actually spoke at a conference as well, the APSPA conference. Are you familiar with APSPA? 
Um, no, tell me. Sure. So it's a, an association, National Association for Private Practice Owners. So if any of your listeners are interested in being a private practitioner or maybe already are a private practitioner, it's an incredible community. They have an annual conference. I spoke at it last year in Phoenix. They're having another one this year in May in Orlando, just where Asha was. So I get to go to, fortunately for me, it's a quick drive up to Orlando, but I'll be there in May of 2020 as well. And it's just a great community for like-minded SLPs and private practitioners to get together, share success stories, share areas of opportunity. And they have incredible speakers, excluding myself, obviously, or including myself, but they have three days worth of lectures and it's just a wonderful community to be a part of. So I asked to speak at that conference because one of the board members was the supervisor for my wife during her CF. And she said, great, let's have somebody come talk to us about finances. And for that community, it was specifically on a topic called exit planning. So every business owner, myself included, every private practice owner has to leave their business at some point, um, either voluntarily or involuntarily. You can also think about that caveat voluntarily or involuntarily. Right. And that's, and I was going to say, you can think about it just like yourself, right? Everyone has the grandiose plan of reaching retirement someday, but there are all of these different obstacles and threats that can exist during your career that might prevent you from getting to retirement. So traditionally people think of saving money into maybe a retirement plan or an investment account, things like that. But one of the things that my team and I really pride ourselves on is making sure that everyone does have their financial priorities in order and make sure that they sort of follow a flow chart of items to make sure that certain threats are always eliminated and you can ideally reach your investment goals, your saving goals, or your retirement goals. So I spoke at that APSPA conference and that was just me. And then all of a sudden, there was an incredible outpouring of support from members of that community. So I have now many private practitioners as clients, and that's what led to the brand and creation of Utterly Financial. And so I've devoted my career now to working with SLPs and private practitioners when before I met my wife, I didn't even know what an SLP was. So yeah, little go, did go you figure. know. Go yeah. figure. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you said she works in this. Uh, this is pure curiosity. It, does your wife have a private practice with speech pathology? Great question. So at this time, she does not. She works uh, pre- as an independent contractor for a large staffing agency down here in South Florida. Um, she does aspire to have a private practice at some point, but we just did have our second child a few months ago. So... For all you female SLPs out there, that's an important planning process too, thinking about children, having children, what does that look like? So she's been on maternity leave for the last few months. And so at some point in the next few years, she does hope to launch her own private practice. Wonderful. Uh, Well, thank you for the background on you. And I know that we have um, a wide listening audience uh, for speech science that Hopefully we, we can reach speech pathologists working in a lot of different settings. Um, but I know that you mentioned you have the kind of a firm order of operations that SLP should follow. So I'll let you go ahead and take the stage there. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I think it's important regardless of if you are still in CF, if you're working for an employer, if you're an independent contractor, or even a private practice owner, there, there's sort of a standard prioritization that you should have because as I mentioned previously, while it is everyone's goal to eventually reach retirement, there are things that can happen along the way. And so a question for you, Michelle, is okay. what are, what would you think are some of the things that can cause financial failure or prevent you from actually reaching retirement? Um, for, oh goodness. Okay. Financial failure. What do you mean? So if your goal is, to, I guess, let me ask you. So what yeah. made you want to become a speech pathologist? What made me, gosh, I know you're flipping the tables on uh, me. I'm, <laughs> I'm being interviewed now. Um, yeah. No, I I always wanted to work. I, I thought about a lot of different things. I was pre-physical therapy, um, education. I loved the idea of being in a school, but being in a medical setting and speech pathology, you can do both. And I love language. So okay. the biggest thing was, was being able to incorporate those and work one-on-one with people every day. Right. So 
it sounds like you're very passionate about it. You love working with others. You love the science and the language behind it, right? So you, most people go to work for that. They truly love their calling, whatever their passion may be. In this case, it's for you being a speech pathology. So that's usually one of the reasons. And there's another major reason why people go to work. What's that? Financial. Reason? Exactly, right? To make money, to make, to make an income and, and earn I a gotta living. I got to eat and live and, right. and have di fun too. We were, we were talking a little bit before, right? Diapers are not cheap. You got to... This provide, is true. I just on a, the kid. I was just talking on a recent episode about putting together a diaper cake, and I'm like, diapers are pricey, man. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best <laughs> gift you can give. Exactly. So right. So people go to work because it gives them passion and because they need to earn a living. So you earn a living, and you need the income from your job in order to provide cash flow for we jokingly say diapers, but for everything that you want in life, right? Whether that's saving for retirement putting gas in the car, you name it. And so mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the number one priority and number one threat that we always want to eliminate are for our, our clients or anyone we really believe is to ensure that no matter what happens to you, you'll always have an income coming into you. Mm -hmm. So we always want to reduce or eliminate the threat of income loss. And so some of the ways to prevent that are there are certain products in the financial services industry, one's called disability insurance. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we'll always review is whether or not an SLP has adequate disability or as we call it, income insurance. Because we all know stories, a, a quick story. I was talking to a, a private practice owner client today and she told me that her clinical director's husband was suffered a TBI in the workplace setting. Wow. And he just she uh, just had a, a disability insurance settlement um, where he will no longer be able to work for them. So, without having adequate income protection or disability protection, they fortunately were able to get something from the insurance company. But to put it quantitatively, if you think about someone who might is listening and might just be graduating CF, and let's say they're earning fifty thousand dollars a year right out of school. If they're planning to work over the next 30 or 35 years and they're going to get a 3% raise, let's say, for inflation purposes, that's three to $3.5 million of income that's going to come into their life over their working career. Mm -hmm. Over so, that working career. So, yeah. right. So you went to school, you got your bachelor's degree, you got your master's, some of you got your doctorates, you put all this effort into your schooling to earn this income and have this potential career. And every SLP I know can share similar stories, whether it's a TBI, if you work in a hospital setting, if you work in a SNF, all these different, if you work with children on the spectrum, there's all these different d disorders and things that you can see that can happen. And so we mm -hmm. always want to make sure that no matter what happens, that an income can come into you. So the solution for that and where we always start with our financial prioritization is reviewing disability insurance. Mm -hmm. Disabilities, yeah. Um, it's it's funny you mentioned that too, because my husband and I have just been working out our our plans for financial with disability and life insurance. So this well, is a good conversation. You're seal, you're sealing my number two. So uh -oh. just to just to conclude with the disability. So again, with a wide variety of listeners, some a lot of different solutions exist. Maybe it's if you work as a W-2 employee and you work for a school district or a hospital or an employer, they might offer you group disability insurance. So that's one solution. But the caveat is many people don't read the fine print. And so anytime you sign up for an insurance contract, it is a contract between you and the insurance company. So there are certain technical definitions and terms that go into these contracts. So you want to make sure what you have is what you want it and need it to be. So for instance, I'll, another question for you. Okay. If, do, do you think w which of the following, choice A or choice B, would be a better version of a disability insurance contract? Choice A would be if you work for a school district with hundreds of employees and they give it to you for free, or choice B would be an individually owned disability insurance contract that you have tailored specifically to being an SLP. I'm gonna go with option two. <laughs> Correct. And so, <laughs> so oftentimes people will say, oh, I have coverage at work or I have some benefit through my employer or through an association that I'm a member of. And mm -hmm. that could be a certain b great building block or a foundation. But 
an example in the most, without getting super technical and getting into all the fine print tonight, I think it's important to just know the main thing to look for when you're looking at these contracts. Mm -hmm. There's going to be something in there called the definition of disability. And the two main choices are going to be true own occupation disability insurance. And the other one's called any occupation insurance. So true own, true owner, oc, true owner occupation. What that's written to is your specific skill set. So let's say you're a speech pathologist and you work in the school district and you require fine motor skills because you play activities or you do activities with children. And all of a sudden you develop carpal tunnel syndrome and you can no longer hold objects or maybe it's a, you start developing MS, something like that, where you might not notice it or somebody passing on the street may not know you have a disability. Mm -hmm. But again, that doesn't mean wheelchair. It doesn't mean incapacitated. It just means not being able to do the specific duties of your job. Mm -hmm. So, so the you job have, you held, yeah. Yeah, with your specific job requirements and functionality. So the other choice, any owner occupation, that would be the same situation. You're working with children and you develop something. But if you have any own occupation, if you could be a cashier at Whole Foods, if you could be a greeter at Walmart, if you're able to fill any occupation, it's likely that the disability insurance company won't pay. That's so, interesting. Yeah. So, so lesson yeah. in learning to read the uh, fine print and know yes. what our coverage is. Yeah, especially for something yeah. with, with like disability insurance because it's, there's a lot of gray area. It's not so black and white. As you just mentioned, another thing to pr help protect um, – the income to your family and your household or anyone dependent on your income is life insurance. And that's pretty black and white. Um, the, the main thing for that I'd like to stress is it really is just an income replacement source for, again, anybody reliant on your income, whether that's a spouse, children, parents, cousins, uncles, charity, if, if you feel so inclined. But what the life insurance does is it provides a lump sum payment to a beneficiary whom you designate. And that can be anyone who has insurable interest in you. Again, a lot of the family members that I just mentioned um, or anyone reliant on your income. And so, again, you might be able to get some through your employer. You might be able to get some on the open marketplace. But if you have anyone reliant on your income, super important to get coverage put in place. So that they're protected in case something would happen to you, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So we've got income security, of course, with disability and then life insurance. Yep. And then the next thing that we'll often recommend is to have a tiny emergency fund. Okay. And so I find that a lot of people misconstrue emergency fund with a one-time expense. So for instance, if you blow out a tire on your car, and you need to come up with $200 for a new tire, expenses like that come up kind of frequently, whether it's a broken down car or a dishwasher that needs a new part, something that requires some type of maintenance. So uh, we'll often build into people's budgets sort of a buffer of maybe, a, depending on your income, a few hundred dollars, a thousand dollars a month, whatever it like can be. Like a maintenance buffer. <laughs> exactly. Just because yep. things happen in life and we all know that but it's also good to have an emergency fund designated with maybe three to six months of liquidity, liquidity being liquid savings, things that aren't, that are readily accessible if you need access to the money. And we'll often encourage people to keep that outside of their traditional banking institution. So okay. if you, so not where you keep your checking or immediate savings account, and we want you to keep it somewhere else, because if you keep it somewhere else, it's much less likely it'll get commingled with your checking and your savings because I don't know about you, Michelle, but for me, if the, with the bank that I bank with, it's very easy to move your checking account money to your savings account. And then if something comes up, you move the savings account back into mm -hmm. the checking. Well, and nowadays it's a couple of clicks on our, our phones. I know. It's, so, <laughs> right? it's exactly. It's so easy. So you want to make sure that you can have this earmarked separately um, away from everything. And in the event of a true emergency, um, you have access to that. Is that something where I know people have set up before uh, the CDs or some other kind of account that they can't access for a period of time? Yeah, great question. I would say not a CD because if you ac if you have to get into the CD early, you're going to have to pay penalty for accessing okay. the CD. So there are online savings accounts um, that offer 
greater than zero interest rate, like what a traditional savings account does at your large banks. So if you do that, you might earn some interest on your money as well. But again, it, it's readily liquid. It's accessible. A CD is good because it helps earn interest. So we'll get to that in a few minutes about how to use your money to make more money. But you want to make sure that if you put it into a type of product that if you want to access the money, you aren't penalized if you have to access the money early and that it's liquid and that it's readily available if you need it. Okay. So after, the, after you reviewed those insurances and you talk about the emergency fund, for those CFs or maybe SLPs who recently finished grad school, the next thing we want to talk about are student loans and debt payments. Okay. So depending on your situation, I think you'd have to have me back on for a few episodes if we wanted to go into depth <laughs> yeah. about student loan topics because they're, they're just, there's so much to talk about. Agreed. But yeah. I think the main thing, especially if you're a CF and you haven't graduated or you just graduated and you're not really sure what type of setting you want to work for, the two main things to think about are, do I want to qualify for something called PSLF? So that's Public Student Loan Forgiveness. And what that does is if you work in a public setting, maybe it's a hospital setting or someone that's considered a nonprofit, a 501c3, what will happen is you will get, after making 10 years of payments or 120 months, the government will excuse whatever interest is left on your student loan payments. So depending on the size of your loans and the amount of debt you owe, it could be really advantageous to work in a certain type of setting. And make those consistent payments so that you can yeah, that's, there's apply a lot, for the loan forgiveness, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of detail that goes into that. Um, one thing I'll chime in here and say, I'm not the expert on every financial topic, just like, just like how SLPs, you might decide to go into a niche someday, work on something specific. Maybe it, you want to work with AAC or a very specific narrow topic and focus on something. Um, there are people who are student loan experts. That's all they do. A contemporary of mine actually started her own company and that's all she focuses on. Um, wow. servicing, helping people make the correct student loan decision. Um, and so, yeah, it's a huge opportunity. To, and if you're not on top of it and, you're, and you don't really know that world well, it's really important to work in all aspects of life with experts. Um, mm -hmm. And so... And find it, a financial planner who... Sure can talk the lingo of speech pathology, right? <laughs> right. No. And I, I think, I think my, our main role on our team is to really, I mean, we we're, we're certainly have a, have our knowledge in specific areas, but we're readily quick to use and lean on others. So for instance, we don't originate mortgages for clients, but we know the different types of mortgages. We know what type of mortgage might be appropriate for you. And so we'll help you walk through those steps of deciding, well, what length of my mortgage should it be? What, what's the advantage of doing this, a 15 year mortgage versus a 30 year mortgage, or maybe even an interest only mortgage. There's all these different types. Um, so we're not the ones who implement the mortgage, but we'll help walk you through the steps of what mortgage you, sh you should be, be considering. And then you'll work with a mortgage broker to implement a certain type of mortgage. And so, just like we as SLPs make our individualized treatment plans or plans of care, it sounds like you guys really tailor to each each client what their needs are. Exactly. Yep. And so for, if you don't have any student loans, I'm sorry, the last few minutes were probably not worth your time. But again, they with, can fast forward if they. Yeah. <laughs> OK, perfect. <laughs> so once you address the student loans and the other one, if, if you're not going to do qualify for PSLF. If you want to go work for maybe a private practice or something like that, you'll always want to consider refinancing. And that's good for any type of debt. Um, what's refinancing a home mortgage, an auto loan, a student loan, you refinance if, well, lately in the marketplace, interest rates have been coming down. And again, this is all time. I don't know, but the time you'll be listening to this. So Mm -hmm. If interest rates are going down, it's an opportunity to refinance and pay a lower interest on the debt that you're servicing. And so if that's the case, you always want to pay as low interest as possible because interest is how lending institutions and banks make money. So mm -hmm. if you pay less interest, you pay less cash flow out of pocket and your cost overall is going to be lower. You got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. So once you get through all of that about the loans, the next thing I'll encourage is to 
get your employer match into your retirement plan. So if you work for an employer, you'll most likely have the option of a retirement plan. So you may have heard some terms, called, something called a 401k, or if you work in the school district, a 403b, or maybe if you work at a hospital, a 457 plan. And so it's important to know the rules of every of your employer's retirement plan. So oftentimes employers want to incentivize their employees to contribute to these retirement plans and they'll give you something called a match. So what a match is, is let's say my employer has a 3% match on the first 3% of my money that I put in. So if I'm earning, I like round numbers. So if I earn a hundred thousand dollars, if I earn a hundred thousand dollars and I put $3,000 into my retirement plan, three, that's 3% of my income. My employer will then put 3% or an additional $3,000 into that retirement plan as well. So therefore, by putting $3,000 in, I really have $6,000. So it's a wonderful resource to, and access. You can consider it almost free money because they're just matching it because you're putting it in. So that has nothing to do with what type of investment you put it in or what selection you'll put within the retirement plan. Just for putting money in, they'll often reward you with that called a match. So you want to know the rules around the match. Other things like the vesting schedule. Um, a good term to know is every retirement plan has something called a summary plan description, an SPD. And okay. that's something that's required to be given to employees once they start working somewhere. So that's, again, we talked about the insurance fine print. This is the retirement account fine print. This tells you about how to access money if you need to, what what you're eligible for, if you can take loans or withdrawals or when you can do that, what the matching formula is, what the vesting schedule is, so when you have access to the money. And now so, you said vesting specifically, because I know that that was the topic that came up recently with um, friends and coworkers of mine. What does that typically mean? Can you give an example of vesting? Sure. So if I'm an employer and I have a five-year vesting schedule on my retirement plan, the vesting schedule is when you'll have access to the matched portion of money. So any money that you put in, the employee contribution, as soon as it goes in, it's your money. So if you terminate employment, either on your end or are terminated or leave employment, there's a separation, you're always able to access your money. So vesting doesn't apply to your money. It's just on the matched money. Okay. So if, so if there's a five-year vesting period, what would happen is, depending on how it's structured, there's two popular types. One's called a level vesting schedule, where over the five years, 20% per year will vest. So if I have $1,000 vesting each year, I'll have access to 20% the first year, 40% the second year, 60% okay. the third year, and so forth. So it's gradual. Exactly. And then the second kind is something called a cliff vest, where I don't see it a lot, but it does exist, where you have no access to the match until you hit that fifth year. So essentially, if you leave at four years and 11 months of employment, you would get no portion of the match if it's there. Okay. So in that summary plan description, you'll see it, there's going to be a vesting schedule or a vesting box. Um, and that's important to know because maybe there's another offer out there. Maybe there's a better setting for you or you just want to change. And so you want to make sure that you have access to those monies. All right. Makes sense. Thank you for explaining that because I know. Yeah. Now, so this is totally a personal note, but um, I was thinking my my husband's active duty military, which comes up on the podcast. That's why we yeah. bounce around in our, uh, right. where, why I have more licenses in speech well, thank, pathology than, than him, I want. Thank him for his service for me. I will, I will pass that along and thank, thank you, you for your support. Um, but would that be considered, would military be considered a cliff version of vesting? So the mili military, or if you have a government job, maybe you're an SLP working in a government setting, yeah. they most likely have access to something called the TSP, the Thrift Savings Plan. Mm -hmm. And again, that's probably a topic for its own show. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that most likely does not have, uh, without knowing or seeing the specifics, I, I don't want to state whether it does have a vesting or not. But just knowing, again, he'll have access to that summary plan description. He'll have the rules. He'll have the regulations. And I'm usually cautious on giving oh, without no, seeing I wasn't, the documents. But, I wasn't yeah. meaning an exact, uh, exact advice right. for, for us. No, but. I get it. But it, everyone does, every employer usually does have that. It's rare to see even no vesting schedule where you get your money right away because 
the employer wants to make sure that they're getting bang for their dollar for giving you the vest. They want you to be employed as well, right? For a certain period of time. So just moving on a yeah, little go bit. Ahead. Um, <laughs> the next one I would encourage everyone to do is, this is sort of like a broad-based topic, but financial literacy. I know a lot of SLPs weren't exposed to it in grad school. Um, I would say lot- majority of SLPs do not <laughs> get financial planning in grad school. <laughs> right, so the majority. So there's a, t- a ton of resources available, um, plenty of books, podcasts, uh, websites, blogs, so many good resources out there. Um, just I would brush up if you can on certain topics. Um, one book that I read recently is one, if I can make a recommendation. Please go ahead. It, we love uh, recommendations. <laughs> so it's, it's called, I will teach you to be rich. And it's sort of a crash course on some of the things that I was just talking about. And in that, in those, in the book, the author talks about these different things and it's just a really good crash course. It teaches you ways to avoid high interest credit card debt, use credit card point systems, use build these emergency funds, how to analyze summary plan descriptions, kind of the things we were just talking about. It's a really good intro to personal finance book. So something that I'll recommend for people from time to time. Okay, great. I wrote it down. We can even include that in the the show notes. As oh, a perfect. So, okay, great. Yeah. And then just some other, I guess. If you do work for an employer, always know your employer benefits. Um, We talked a little bit about the fine print for certain types of insurances, but you also want to know the difference between the health insurances, other benefits that a lot of people can often overlook, um, something called a health savings account, an HSA. Are you familiar Mm -hmm. with that, Michelle? I did. I had one one at my first job out of college. Great. It's actually one of the most underutilized Uh, financial products or resources because it has a a triple tax savings benefit attached to it. So Hmm. the money goes in pre-tax, just like your 401k plan, right? If you choose the pre-tax option, the money can also grow. You can invest it in the HSA so it can grow tax deferred. And then if you use the money on a qualified medical expense, it will come out and you don't have to pay uh, tax on the distribution. So we all have medical bills. We all have medical expenses. Um, Oftentimes people will use that as an ancillary retirement savings vehicle because healthcare gets really expensive Mm -hmm. as we age. And you know you're going to have health expenses. Right. And so even if, but if, if, if if you know that you, your spouse, your children are going to have upcoming medical expenses as well, it's just another resource to put money away. And so for in in 2020 for a family uh for spouses the max you can contribute is seven thousand one hundred dollars so if you're going to use all that on medical expenses if you were in it let's something let's say a 20 percent tax bracket uh i should use the round number see what happens when i even i don't even i need a calculator now for the round numbers how you admit but, that there we go yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were put 7100 away at and you were in a 20% tax bracket, that would save you, let's say, almost $1,500 in tax because you're using it on medical expenses. And the only qualifier for getting an HSA is you have to be enrolled in something called a high deductible health plan, an HDHP. So if your employer, that's some of the options to evaluate. The the downside of a high deductible health plan is that you have a high deductible. So Mm -hmm. as you know, if you work in the medical billing or reimbursement, you certainly know all these terms. So if you do have a high deductible, some of our listeners will for sure. Yeah. No, yeah. So I was definitely enough to spend a lot of time on that. But if you have a three thousand dollar family deductible, you need to at least have three thousand dollars saved somewhere. So that's a good benchmark maybe for that emergency fund that we talked about. So that way, if God forbid a medical emergency happened, you know that you will at least fill your deductible. You could always use the three thousand dollars from the HSA to help pay that deductible too. So knowing that you have those resources and figuring out, do I want high deductible, low deductible? And that's also applicable across auto insurance, homeowners insurance, all these other insurances that you'll need. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying to think, so I've been making quick notes, but I'm going to let you jump ahead to to cover what you'd like because I know we don't have too much more time. Yeah, no, that's that. I would say that's sort of a crash course and what we look to evaluate when we work with clients. And so just to bring the conversation full circle, when we work with clients, we make sure that all these different threats 
are eliminated. So we talked about income loss via illness through disability insurance. We talked about the value of life insurance, other types of insurance. And then we talked about different buckets on how you want to start saving money because to us, the ideal scenario is clients are able to reach retirement and in order for someone to reach retirement, they'll be able to produce the same after tax cash flow that they had while they were working. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So if I were to, if I were to offer you uh, without knowing your salary right now, but if I were to write you a check right now, Michelle, for whatever you and your husband earn and had that available for you in perpetuity, let's call it $10,000 a month. Would, would you be able to retire? I mean, I would, I would love to have the same income when we retire. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that, so that's the goal that people look for. And so how do you get there? You have to make sure you're saving adequately. You're using all the resources like a employer match investing. We didn't even get to investing, um, <laughs> but, but certain types of, in, we'll different types of investments. <laughs> yeah. But you talked about different types of investments, right? So you want to, we talked about earning money on your money. So the way you do that is by have, earning interest or a rate of return on your investment. So that way, instead of just putting the money under the mattress or in a checking account earning 0%, you can start earning 3 4 5 10% on that money, which will help you reach your financial goals quicker. And it might not just be retirement. It might be saving for a down payment in a house. It might be saving for a child's education. Mm-hmm. Whatever's important to you financially. Well, and I, I really appreciate it. You just taking the time to kind of be a reminder for all of us, especially in this field of terms to know and things to ask when it comes to job interviews, when it comes to um, planning for the next five years, the next 10 years, you get that question in interviews sometimes. Um, but personally, what we want to be able to do, whether that's private practice or with a large employer. Um, I was going to ask, what would you say is um, the most important or the couple most important questions for someone to ask if they're tra- looking into hiring and working with a financial planner? Yeah, I think it's important to know a few different things. I think it's important to know how the advisor will be compensated. So there's a lot of different ways in which financial professionals can, can earn a living and be compensated. So I wouldn't be afraid to ask that question. Um, when you talk about investments too, I think it's important to know what their investment philosophy is if you want them to help manage money. Um, for instance, I'm a believer in something called evidence-based investing, just like you have evidence-based practice and for You're certain types of speech. speaking our language. There you go. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> so there's people who might be, who might say, you know, invest in this hot stock or this certain type of investment and it'll get you an incredible rate of return. But through evidence-based investing and analyzing markets and historical returns, what we know is what certain expectations are for certain types of investments. So it may not be the sexiest type of investment or one that gets the most buzz, but we do know historically it works and we're believers in that markets operate efficiently. We believe, my team and I, that if there were, if there were advantages out there, then people would have found them by now. We believe Mm -hmm. that markets operate very efficiently. So if someone's trying to tell you something that will earn a a great rate of return or something that's unreasonable, well, we have the math and the science behind all of that to show you why, how the investment portfolios that we invest are constructed. So I think it's important also for the an advisor ask what their philosophy is on educating do you want someone to just be a delegator or do you want to actually learn about the different topics and know how things work um so i think those are the big three that i would consider um yeah well and thank you so much i i really want to make sure we give everyone a way to where can they find out more about you about utterly financial and where could they get in touch with you if they have follow-up questions yeah so you can check us out on our website it's utterly financial one word dot com uh we're also on most forms of social media so you can connect with me directly either on linkedin uh instagram at c goldslager um it is exciting and something that I didn't even say to you yet, Michelle. So we mentioned at the beginning that we met at an SLP podcast room 
um, mm-hmm. at it was Asha. our live event at Asha for anyone yeah, who's there. Yeah, super, mm-hmm. super exciting. I was like a deer in the headlights. Should I come and check this thing out? And it was so engaging and so welcoming that uh, my team and I were actually going to be launching our own podcast. So it's going to be specifically kind of talking about some of the topics we talked about tonight, but just much more detail and helping you SLPs decide, do I want to start private practice? How do I, if I am a private practice owner, how do I exit it? What are the financial things I need to know? I mentioned earlier about what are realistic rates of return or certain investment strategies. We'll get into more details about that. Um, You know, we'll talk in much more detail about some of these topics because as you said very clearly, Michelle, and I would say 95% of SLPs I meet, it's just something that was not brought up to you in school. It was not something that you had built into your foundation. And so our goal is to help educate and help improve the financial decision making of all SLPs and private practice owners. So super excited to launch that podcast um, and help just the name of it so people can keep an eye out. Yeah, the name is SLP money. I like it. SLP money. We'll, we'll, we'll get the hashtags going too. SLP yeah, money. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So yeah. And then you can always, on the website, you can shoot us an email. You can uh, contact, I don't want, I don't know if I want to give out my cell phone, but that, maybe another, no, maybe another right. time. Social media is good. <laughs> yeah. We'll find you on there and um, Utterly Financial is the name oh, of and this the last, company. The last, the last plug. I don't know if anyone's a, a fan of the ASHA blog, The Leader Live. Mm-hmm. But my wife did have an article published in the blog a few weeks ago. So we were super excited about that. And that was actually about her experience from deciding to become a W-2 employee to a 1099 independent contractor. Okay. So she actually walked through her decision-making process. Um, it helped that I was around to help with some of that. But um, she reached those conclusions on her own. And she was for, she decided she wanted to write an article. And fortunately, the leader live wanted to run the story. So and what is the title of that? So in case anyone wants to uh, look it up, uh, title or her yeah. name so we can. Oh, her her name is Lauren, same last name, Goldslider, right. but I believe it was called Five Reasons I Switched from W-2 Employee to 1099 Contractor. Awesome. Well, we will keep an eye out for that. I'm going to look up her article. And for anyone who wants to get in touch with you, as you mentioned, utterlyfinancial.com. Yeah. If you're going to be at, if you're going to be at this APSPA conference in May. So I go, I travel the ASHA circuit. I'll be at ASHA Connect in Dallas. Um, Hopeful to go to ASHA in California in 2020. So do they have a ribbon? I feel like they should for spouses of um, SLPs who at the conference. Well, my big bet, I don't know. Uh, it's in my it's in my office. I'm in my home office tonight, but I have the ASHA presenter badge. That was the main reason I was at ASHA last year. I was fortunate enough to uh, lead a session there. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, maybe I'll have them do that. I'll have them put on a spouse. Uh, yeah, we need a, I can start we need my an own SLP, group. SLPS or something, you know, yeah, SLP exact, spouse. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Craig. I know there's things that I will take away from this that I can talk to my family about and what our goals are. And um, thank you for doing what you do for our field and to help us all reach the goals that we want to reach financially. And I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. Welcome back to Speech Science, episode number 140. I'm Matt Hot, joined by the wonderful Michelle Wintering. Hi. And the fantabulous Michael McLeod. What's up, buddy? Guys, I need to say that I am addicted and this is my intervention plan. Um, I can't stop watching TikToks again. I am back on the TikTok train and it is scary. I would love to see what your TikTok algorithm is. So I was discussing And what is coming up. It's probably a nice mix of wrestling and- uh, Amazon reviews and kids going through drive throughs So, uh, Michelle, are you familiar with TikTok and how it works? How it works? No. Do no. I scroll through TikTok videos? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> so basically it builds your algorithm based on how often you watch a video on repeat and how you like videos. Right. And, uh, there is somebody that I know that was trying to defend to his wife, uh, uh why his TikTok algorithm was not correct based on the videos that he was watching okay but 
they, they may not be what his wife was happy to see. But let me flip through my TikTok feed <laughs> to show you live here and y'all can judge or not judge. So we've got Cincinnati Fave visiting ice cream parlors in Cincinnati. We have Mrs. Rogers World live. She's a like high school teacher. So she talks about her class. We've got Amazon Prime. We've got, what is this? This is a guy showing why you should be fired at work, but he's not fired at work. <laughs> and we have, uh, what are you doing in the pandemic? So <laughs> I'm innocent on TikTok, y'all. It's mostly teachers and dad talk, unfortunately. Okay. Michelle, what's it. your for your page, FYP page? FYP, what? Do you not have the app? F There's an FYP page. I didn't know that. Do you have an app? Do you have the app, Michelle? For TikTok? Yeah. No. <gasps> Download the app, and then they'll give you videos that look like the videos you like to watch. Oh. <laughs> so I'll spend more time on my phone. <laughs> yes, it's terrible. I need someone else to be addicted with me. I need to not download that app. That's and it's called the FYP. It's for your page. For, I've already for... taken off my phone apps like Facebook so that I don't have check you really? it. Have you really? I'm not I need off to get rid Facebook. of the Star Trek I just game. But... took the app off my phone. Oh, this is my favorite one. They do wrestling moves with their baby. <laughs> That's funny. Wrestling moves with All of our daughters are going to be doing. <laughs> That's Mike and his baby. I can see it. Yeah, there you go. So... All righty, let's jump back into this. Every week we take a look at what Asha is doing right because it is super easy to be critical of what Asha is doing wrong. And that was a heated conversation on one of the Facebook pages this week. Did you all see that? Nope. Michelle, mm -hmm. you just avoid all conflict, don't you? That's not true. Not all of it. Am I, like I have a, a bad a... person? <laughs> I have no, a... No, of course not. A giggly little almost four month old daughter that is more entertaining so there that's, you go that's fair i had to defend a fellow slp podcaster today oh no because someone like they had said that they talked about asha and uh, someone was like yeah i listened to 20 minutes of your show and it was too much flip or uh uh, uh too much talking not enough getting into the asha thing oh god shut and i was up. like hey dude there is a fast forward button <laughs> like, they talked to our show is that what you said no 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 it was about another show um and it was by the uh, slp toolkit people hey if you want to do it start a podcast because it is it is not as easy as it looks it's very easy guys it's well easy. yeah but it's <laughs> sitting but <laughs> sitting up and doing it the and doing it <laughs> 99% of it is showing up and we show and it up takes time. year after hey, year. We are in the top year. 20% by the I know we've been the doing way. this for years, guys. Five years. This is the fifth season. We're in the top years. 20%. Which is by completely the way. insane. Three years with the three of us. Oh, yeah. That's, that's right. right. That's right. So Damn, dude. Well, anyway, so I was defending it because <laughs> I was like, come on. But they were talking about Asha and, and such. Uh, and I guess their conclusion was that Ash is not all bad, kind of like what we do, where Ash is not all bad. They can definitely do better, but whatever. So anyway, this is the Ash spotlight segment where we say, hey, Ash is not as terrible, or we spotlight where they are terrible. Guess what happened on April Fool's Day? Michelle, you posted this, so you can't guess. Yeah, that's why I'm not guessing. Mike? Uh, Good know. answer. Nebraska became the critical 10th state to adopt the interstate compact, joining Alabama, Kansas, Ken, uh, Kentucky, Louisiana, uh, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Utah, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Mm. So now that they got the critical 10 Kansas states. Kansas and Kentucky are on there? Yeah. That's good news. Yeah, not Texas, though. I know, but I have a Kentucky <laughs> license. And a Kansas. I have Kansas. I oh, you don't have Kansas? Mm -mm. Oh. Uh, but now what We're they say- We're only here for 10 months. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Uh, the next step is to create the compact commission made up of an audiologist and SLP from each compact state. Come on, Ohio. I'm free. I just stepped down from my OSLA position. Let me join the Ohio but side. 10 means it's happening. I know. Uh, so anyway, what they've done is the SLP and an uh, audiologist from each state 
had a cough, so excuse Bless me. Bless you. Thank you. I wasn't uh, sure if it was a sneeze or a the, cough because you yeah. muted yourself. The commission will be responsible for oversight and the creation of unnecessary rules and bylaws. This is expected to occur within one year, and ASH members and the public will begin to benefit from the uh, ASLPIC in 2022. Mm-hmm. That is freaking awesome, y'all. That's fantastic. The Audiology Speech Language Pathology Interstate Compact, the ASLPIC. I'm that it becomes a tipping point of we have that 10 that more states will quickly Azel jump pick. on. Azel pick. That is how I'm going to call it now. We have Asha and Azel pick. <laughs> okay. No, I think you're right, Michelle. I think, I think in Ohio, there's still... It took de- me a minute to process what you were saying with this made-up word. Azel pick. <laughs> um, guys, I'm so sorry. I just... <laughs> But no, I think you're right. I think more states will be joining this 10. I know in Ohio, they were discussing it and it was up for a vote at some point. So I feel like when people talk about needing SLPs, recruiting SLPs into high need districts or areas or hospitals or clinics, the more streamlined you can make the licensing process, the easier it will be to find qualified SLPs. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, maybe we'll reach out to ASHA President Lynn Williams to join us on one of these ASHA Spotlight segments. And uh, we can talk a little bit about the ASL pick. <laughs> now it's just sounding ridiculous. I am, Mike, do you have a better version of ASL PIC? I do not. ASL pick. That is let's, go with, is. let's go with that. You have ASHA, you have the GIFTA. You have the self, you have Azelpick. It, that's no, Ma- Mike does not say Gifta. He is one of the few SLPs I know who never says Gifta. Michelle, I think <laughs> we're in the very few SLPs who use the term Gifta. I think that's an Ohio University thing. No, it's ever, not. I've, I've worked it. in. It's true. I've worked in how many states now, and a lot of people say Gifta. See, at my school district, I'll be like, "Can someone send me the Gifta?" And they were like, "I'm like the Goldman Fristo." test of articulation and they're like you no, could Mike just says the all Goldman. the letters the gfta yeah ah. mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> it's true i do yeah i never thought of that <laughs> i'm there gonna put go. that i'm gonna put that on our instagram take a survey how do you say it do you say the letters or do you make up your own word oh my goodness <laughs> SpeechSciencePodcast.com. I'm going to contact the creators of the Gifta <laughs> and say, are, who is saying it correctly? 6811798. Y'all, I ran into a weird thing where a non-SLP was giving SLP tests. It was so weird, by the way. I mean, they're that is techni- very weird. They're technically licensed to do it. They were like a Yeah, psych. depending on the test, but right? It just, it, yeah, but it just was weird. There, I was in a meeting where somebody that was not me was talking about the results of a test that I normally give. And they explained did they, it. Did they double check to make sure you hadn't given that test? Because that's where it gets a little tricky. They explained it better than what I do. And I was taking Aww. notes and I was like, oh, I should explain it that way. That makes You're so like, that much was, more sense. That was good. <laughs> Here's the cross-disciplinary oh, skill set, right? Uh, let's hit the headlines, y'all. This is coming from AARP. Dementia is the deadliest underlying condition for COVID-19 patients on Medicare. Nearly one in three beneficiaries with the brain disorder die from the coronavirus, uh, the HHS report showed. So more of a heads up if you're working in the SNFs or home health care or the uh, assisted living, the ALFs, um, to, to kind of know about that. Also kind of terrifying. Uh, second headline, I guess there's no chit chat on that one. No, no. All right. Second one. This is coming from Fox two in Detroit, who I found out is Detroit style pizza. Did you all know that was a thing? I think so. What like, is Detroit style pizza? Do you know what jets is their thick crust pizza? It's like Detroit style. Yeah. I've had jets. Yeah. So the, the thick crust is like Detroit style. I found out. Hmm. Anyhow. I like tavern style, which is very Ohio. Oh, yeah. That's tavern cut. Yep. Crust pizza. Uh, this Mike out. probably has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Mike's like, mm-hmm. I'm from New York. I eat pizza by the slice. No, it's where it's mm-hmm. cut in the squares. Yeah. 
hillbilly hillbilly pizza michelle that's what we eat <laughs> schoolyard pizza fox Fine. 2 detroit uh mom creates the down syndrome diary to help struggling patient or uh, parents and i love this idea this is something that i felt like we need to be doing more as as in the school district i feel like we need to be doing more of this in our clinics but basically it is a diary that she is keeping that she is sharing with parents in other areas of her down syndrome community uh and she started when her when she was 16 weeks pregnant she discovered that her baby benny would be born with an extra chromosome she began di- a diary di- writing in her diary and shares her experiences with other parents. And I think this is the greatest idea that we need to be incorporating more. uh, And that is parent to parent education, because listen, we're all parents in here and congrats, Mike, on, on your baby making it to the vaccine stages and two months old, but thanks, man, man, we don't know what it's like to be a parent of a baby with down syndrome or autism. I'm learning what it's like to be a parent of a baby with a hearing loss. And that's just one baby. So I feel like we need more um, parent crossover education. Well, and like you said, Matt, you've already said connecting with other families Mm -hmm. and professionals has benefited you all in your daughter's only months of life so far. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll give a shout out to uh, her SLP, who actually we went to school with Michelle Leslie. She runs a um, a parent group, and it is wonderful because we just chit chat as parents, mm-hmm. and she's just there to really make sure that we don't go off the rails. But it, it's wonderful. Parent to parent education is not even just education, but needed. support. Miss- Say that again. Not just education, but support oh so yeah support. like like you said allowing parents to, the opportunity to connect and are do you do a lot of parent stuff mike yeah like, all the time do, you, do your parents do a lot of like parent to parent stuff or like do parents meet other parents kind of thing? yeah 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 it happens it happened a lot more when we had a waiting room uh we do not no longer have a waiting room mm-hmm. uh but yeah uh, a, a lot of parents, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll, you know, connect parents if they have, if they're in similar boats, you know what I mean? Do you, Mike, do you no longer have a standing office? No, we still have a clinic. We still, we still okay. have a clinic. Everything's the same. Uh, it's just, you know, because of COVID, we, we yeah. don't want to have, you know, you we had a very small, though. a very small wait. Exactly. We did. Did you uh, really? So, yeah. We have a very <laughs> small, very small waiting room to begin with. Uh, and we don't want people sitting there and breathing on each other. Uh, so it's basically drop off, pick up. Yeah. yeah. I just wasn't sure if, um, if you were doing in clinic at all. So yeah, makes sense. Our last highlight or, uh, excuse me, our last headline is coming out of the BBC world service. A small Wyoming town has attracted families looking for in-person special education. And it talks about the story of Charlotte and her mom, Amy Huffington, moving from California uh, to Powell, Wyoming, a small agricultural town east of the Yellowstone National Park, so that Charlotte could get school uh, in person. And I'm telling you, this is why kind of going back to that parent to parent conversation, like, we need our parents to be educated to rely on each other. And I think it's crazy that school districts were unable to help in this situation and uh, a bunch of families are moving just to get in-person services. I, I've, I've heard of it too. And being you know military connected, I know people in a lot of different places and if they have the ability to send their child and need to have a child in person for whatever service is needed, I know people who've done it between states as well. Uh, the school district says they've spent an additional $82,000 on special education this year. Uh, and they wow. say that, that she's not sure all the families who moved here will stay after this school year. Wow. So the, they had nearly 40 new students was, with IEPs move into the school district by that uh, during this school year. Have you all messed with transition IEPs? It is a nightmare. Oh, yeah. 
It's, it's a pain. <laughs> Did they do testing? What is wrong with this state? I got one from uh, Indiana and it had like half of a goal. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. It was yeah. like, it was a name and it said like, it was something, it, this wasn't the exact thing for, for FERPA HIPAA stuff, but it was like, Jimmy will use R. <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess that's a goal. So, all righty, let's head this thing home. Michelle, tell us what you're doing this next week that is not speech therapy related. Going back to the library, it brings Yay. me joy to be at a library again. Are you a library and nerd? People are spaced out and it's quiet and beautiful. I surrounded was... by books and librarians are the most helpful people in the world. So they are helpful. I, did I would the, be a librarian in an alternate alternate reality. So I, I interviewed the, the Finding Your Yip uh, author, and I asked her what her favorite book was. And she said Worth, uh, Worthington Heights, I believe. So I will ask you, Michelle and Michael, what was the first uh, book that you read till it fell apart? Do you remember? That's a good one. You say till it fell apart, but I have to tell you, I was or, so metaphorically fell apart my books that i might have mentioned this on air at some point so i'm sorry if you're a longtime listener and have heard this but i have two books that my son is now reading one he's reading a ton right now and it still was in pristine condition and i got it in kindergarten because i loved that book so much and it was chicka chicka boom boom oh, and then yeah. the other one was the polar express we read them in kindergarten and i loved them so much i asked for them for christmas and I kept them in really good shape because I loved them so much. And I would put Chicka Chicka Boom Boom back in the little box it came in because it mm -hmm. came with a cassette tape recording where someone read it. Oh. And so I would put it in that box and keep it together. So that book is old. And now my son is putting more wear and tear on it than I ever did because he's Go buy a new book, Michelle. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so Chicka Chicka Boom Boom is the first book that I probably read more times than I could ever, ever, ever count. What about you, Mike? What's the book that you've read more times than you should have? That is a great question. Uh, it was probably a Goosebumps, maybe. Are we talking about like reading to kids or reading ourselves? Both, Both. either. <laughs> That's a good question, man. I take, I'm like OCD when it comes to books. So I don't like to make them fall apart for real i'm staring at my bookshelf yeah i'm like really like when, when i have when i'm reading a book i want it to be in like i want it to stay in pristine condition hey you and i are similar there you go yeah <laughs> so i'm showing you guys a video of what a lady does because she doesn't use a bookmark and that's how she knows what page she's on <laughs> uh, i wouldn't I, I wouldn't be able to no, know that's 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 that that gives me anxiety oh just because that, like, yanks the page my, right out my mm -hmm. skin crawl a little bit <laughs> Yeah, I don't yep, like that. That at was all. worth it, Michelle, to watch your face. Uh, so for me, it was Michael. <laughs> you Crichton's... didn't tell anyone what we were looking at. You yeah, it's a, it was a TikTok video. video of a lady saying that the way she keeps track of her pages is when she's done reading the page, she yanks it out of the book and throws it away. It's a TikTok. So terrible. Um, I don't like that at all. For me, the book that I've read more often than I really should have is Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. I remember the movie came out and I went to the librarian, Mrs. Glazer at my school. And I said, I want to borrow Jurassic Park. And she said I was too young in like second grade. So I told her I would take the book back and I threw it over the wall of our, of our library. Cause our library was just those like metal bookshelves. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. So <laughs> it wasn't like a big wall and I just, chucked it over the little metal wall which was like five feet tall it was a it was hard to do and i told her i wasn't checking out a book and i needed to go to the bathroom and i walked by the wall found my book and i stole jurassic park from the library from the school library and did you ever return it nope and i read it till it fell apart and then i bought another version of it and then my wife bought me a uh, com commemorative version of Jurassic Park. And I this think I read best. that book every this two years. This is my favorite Matt Hot story that I've ever heard. Just a little second grader, just stealing a book from the library because I was told I couldn't read it because I was too young. Oh. 
Wow. Yeah, it was about second grade because what the, that book came out in like 92. Where is Mrs. Glazer? I want to find her oh, now. No, her son and I never got along. I think I blamed him for <laughs> his mom not letting me get out that book. Oh, she was a sweetheart, funny. though. She was really nice. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not even friends with her son, so. Do you think I'm that? <laughs> like, I'm Facebook stalking somebody on. Oh. Hey, um, let me tell you about the um, interview we have coming. Yeah, up. next week we have an interview. What, we're, we're back into the live interviews. What What's going on? So I had a chance to interview Courtney, who is a longtime listener of our show since she was in grad school, and she's now a practicing triple C SLP herself. And um, she and I got to interview each other, actually. So I was oh, interviewed nice. as a pre-interview for her upcoming. It's not... It's not on air yet, I should say. So it's not downloadable yet, but um, keep an eye out because she has a webpage and I think a Facebook called HOH Speechy. And she is a speech language pathologist who is hard of hearing herself. And um, and she has started a podcast as a chance to connect people. And uh, her podcast is going to be called, let me get the name right. It's called Adapting and Overcoming with HOH Speechy. And That's it is awesome. going to be connecting both um, the military community because she c reached out to me when she was in grad school as a um, military connected SLP. Her husband, new husband in the last year they got married uh, is active duty military as well. And also as someone who is hard of hearing, which is not super common in the speech pathology world as you might guess. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Very cool. Uh, future interviews, we got the Finding My Yip, and I am uh, interviewing another uh, surprise speech therapy podcast crew. So, sweet. Yeah. All right. Our Mike, did I ask you what you were doing this week that was not therapy related? You didn't. Yeah. I, Michelle, somehow I asked you that, and then that just kind of moved into a long diatribe mike what are you doing this week that is not <laughs> therapy related that is a great question you don't know do you no i don't <laughs> let's hear from our audience what do you they have do? you have a two-month-old man you don't need that's exactly that's that's that, what that I'm is doing. what you're doing correct uh, non-therapy related i got new garden boxes so i got to tear down my old garden and move it to an above ground garden box so i'm pretty excited about that not bad. What are you going to grow in your garden? Well, hopefully more than the half a pumpkin and three cucumbers that I grew last summer. So. <laughs> I need to find out what I can garden in Central Texas. You know what you can grow in Texas? Tumbleweeds. Okay. And cows. Specifically Central cows. Texas. What cows. plants can I grow that uh, are edible? <laughs> our intro music is Please Listen Carefully by Jazar. <laughs> And uh, it's licensed under an attribution and shit on like license or bump music is County Fair Rock. Copyrighted John Deku. Find his music over at soundcloud.com slash dirt dog music. The informed SLP music at the count by Broke for Free is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. And make sure that yes, we get the, the free uh, hits from the informed SLP, but go subscribe over there. That is some pretty cool content. And our closing music is The Slow Burn by Kevin McLeod. It's licensed under Creative Commons Attribution. License in the immortal words of Janice Wright, be a willow. The oak looks strong, but will crack in a storm. The willow will bend and then return to form. For fellow willows, Michelle Wintering and Michael McLeod, I'm Matt Hot. Until next week, so long, everybody. Bye. So... Speech Science is edited and produced by MWH Production. Please follow Speech Science on Twitter at Speech Science PC and like our page on Facebook. For more original podcasts, please visit ExceptionalEd.com and rate and subscribe to our podcasts anywhere you get your podcasts.